My dad's name was Stephen Nicholas Belichick. In Struthers, my Uncle Steve was known as Steve Belichick. It really is pronounced in Croatian, Belichic. And in Struthers, we all knew it as Belichick. And then when he ended up in the South, then they started pronouncing it as Belichick. Born in Pennsylvania and family moved to uh, Struthers, Ohio, where he grew up. He was the youngest of five. The oldest was his sister, Annie, and then three brothers. Frank, Joe, John, and then my dad, Steve. So my dad was born in 1919 and lived at various locations uh, in Struthers as they were struggling to make ends meet. When he was a teenager, the Great Depression hit, and that was a very tough time for his family. Uh, his dad lost his job, and two of his brothers had to basically drop out of school and go to work. They lost everything. They lost their house and their jobs. Here in Northeast Ohio, back in 1803, James and Danny Heaton found the ore that was lined in Yellow Creek. They built a blast furnace here along the shore, and they made the cannonballs that helped the Union win the war. Here in Youngstown, here in Youngstown, he talked a lot about the Depression and I think was always, to a certain degree, concerned that it might come again. You know, seeing the, the soup lines, the unemployment lines, and all of his father's friends and, and his family standing out there without a job, without, uh, they wanted to work. Uh, they, were, they were willing to work, they wanted to work. There were just no jobs. And so they were literally scrapping and, and saving everything and trying to make the most out of every ounce of food or resource that they had to do odd jobs and just find a way to, to pull it together. Them smokestacks reaching like the arms of God into a beautiful sky of sudden clay. Here in Youngstown, here in Youngstown. There's no way out for him. He's working in the steel mills in high school at uh, Youngstown Sheet and Tube. We've been making steel in Youngstown for more than a century. Steel meant hope for our children. He thought his only thing was to get a job in the mill. And with encouragement from, I know, one of his school teachers, Miss Yeager, she encouraged him able to get a football scholarship. Here in Youngstown, here in Youngstown. Without football, you know, he's a steel worker. Would have done that for his life. Monday, September 19th, 1977, began in the Boardman offices of Youngstown Sheet and Two with the announcement that the company's Camel Works would be shut down by Friday. Well, when the mill went down, the sheet and tube was taken over by LTV, and then they just started selling it off piecemeal, and, and then finally there was nothing left. In Youngstown, in Youngstown, my sweet Jenny, I'm sinking down. Now when I die, I don't want no part of heaven. I'd not do heaven's work well. I pray the devil comes and takes me to stand in the fiery furnaces of hell. Ladies and gentlemen, the news we've received this morning from Youngstown Sheet and Tube is the worst possible news that we could have received. And Youngstown's era of big steel was over. Football was really his, his ticket out of that um, tough situation. Oh yes, without football, he wouldn't have gotten a scholarship to Western Reserve. And that opened the door for him. He fortunately uh, received a football scholarship from my Godfather Bill Edwards at Western Reserve University where he went and worked his way through college, lived in a closet in the upstairs of the gymnasium, worked odd jobs to pay his way through school, and played at Western Reserve for four years, which was good football. Uh, they were a Sun Bowl team, you know, we're a top 20 team at that point. He looked for, you know, some jobs uh, after college and his college coach, Bill Edwards, had taken 
the head coaching position with the Detroit Lions. He offered my dad a job as the equipment manager. Uh, so my dad went up there and was the equipment manager for the Lions. The offense that uh, Coach Edwards used was a little bit unique and it was a spinner series out of the single wing. Uh, my dad was the fullback and in that offense at Western Reserve and uh, it involved some ball handling and some uh, you know, intricate parts of uh, the overall offensive system, kind of like the quarterback in today's system. Anyway, as the year went along and they didn't have a very good year, uh, about halfway through the season, Coach Edwards kind of said to his staff, like, you know, Steve can run this offense um, better than what we got running it. Uh, so they brought him out of the equipment room and put him on the field. So he played uh, basically the second half of the 1941 season for the Lions. He returned one punt in his career against the New York Giants, 67 yards, 67 yard average, highest in NFL history on that one return. Of course, the end of the year uh, in December uh, with the attack on Pearl Harbor. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. He went and enlisted and then ultimately he went to Europe and he was on a transport ship backing up the, the troops in Europe. Dealing with the German submarines crossing the Atlantic and, you know, had some close calls there in the English Channel and then we had victory in Europe and so he was shipped over to uh, Okinawa and for the same thing to, to be support for the, uh, the troops in the Pacific. The battleship Missouri becomes the scene of an unforgettable ceremony marking the complete and formal surrender of Japan. My dad was part of the great generation that lived through the Depression, lived through World War II, he was given an opportunity. He turned that into a coaching career and after being at Hiram, Vanderbilt, North Carolina, when he came to the Naval Academy, he knew that was the right spot for him. My dad loved the Naval Academy. When he had an opportunity to make it a lifetime position and become an instructor and work for the government and teach physical education, as well as coach football, then the roots really started to, to take. Other than his family, his love was the United States Naval Academy and the people at the Naval Academy. I played Navy football uh, for four years, 65 through 69, and that's where I first met Steve Belichick. Steve Belichick was this hard-nosed, old-school guy, and you did not want to mess around with Steve Belichick. I was one of those guys who played second, third team, uh, never quite made it. Finally, I moved up to starting defensive end. So my senior year, we start off at Penn State, and I last about two quarters, and, and I get wiped out with a crack back, and I'm dragged off the field, end of my football career. Once I was injured, they would take the players, and we'd go to a place called Hospital Point. It's a hospital, it's, it's separated from the academy a little by, by a bridge. There's a lot of wide open field there. It's a very austere location. And so you're totally away from the brigade. I mean, you're isolated, you're in a hospital room. You really felt separated from everybody. And I was very disappointed. Nobody came by to see me. Then one Wednesday afternoon, in walks Steve Belichick into my hospital room. I haven't heard that story, but it's not surprising because he stayed connected with those kids all the way through and they would come to his office and talk about life, talk about problems, talk about the challenges of the Naval Academy. What he did for me affected me the rest of my life. 25 years later, I come back as the director of admissions at the Naval Academy. I'm a captain of the Navy. 
And uh, I was able to go back and be part of the uh, Navy football program as the officer rep. And I think it's a leadership characteristic that I would hope I followed with. I made a point of following up on the players who were hurt. Um, and anyway, I just want to tell you that Steve Belichick is a special person in my life. I think that's something that my dad would be very proud of, that he uh, instilled that into another person and then that person carried it forward and was able to impact other midshipmen the way that, that he had. He would be very proud of that. So many of them have come back and said, you know, I don't think I would have made it through without your dad. Coach Belichick was our coach. He coached the punters. The only time Coach Belichick showed us punting films was when he showed us a black and white film of him working with John Stuffelby. He said, hey, uh, I, I want to do a film, just you and I develop a primer for how to teach punting. I, I grew up here now, you know, three years uh, being personally coached by Steve Belichick. And so his voice is something that, you know, just doesn't go out of your head, it's very distinctive. He had a voice that uh, kind of stays with you and you can sort of hear it. He was in charge of our warm-ups. So he would, you know, the whole team goes out in the field as they all do and everybody's got to go through the stretching. And the first thing you would hear from him, you know, was, and I have to touch my nose to make it kind of work, he goes, bend down, bend down, come on, you're not going to be any good. And whenever we wouldn't get it right, Belichick would be standing off uh, to the side and, and he would, and he'd, he'd, he'd crinkle up his brow and he'd make a hole in his mouth and he wouldn't move his jaw when he'd say, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> I can't replicate it, but I hear it, it's in my head. And it's in my head to this day, going through some of his routines and his indoor workouts in the gym, legendary. I've done a lot of tough physical things in my life. Never anything that I could think of was as tough as going through those indoor routines with him in the gym. That was brutal. And you couldn't see it then. When you were a kid, you're like, who is this maniac on my ass incessantly? As you mature, as you grow up, as you go through that program, you come to realize and that guy loved us. It was tough love. Uh, it wasn't always what you wanted to hear. In fact, it usually wasn't what you wanted to hear, but it was the truth. It was honest, it was fair. And once you thought about it and got past the feeling sorry for yourself and actually heard the words that he was saying, you knew it was right. And, uh, and a lot of times very prophetic. John F. Kennedy Stadium, Philadelphia, December 2nd. A near full house turns out for the 73rd renewal of the Army-Navy game. So we go into the Army game and we, we lose. It's an Army day, 23 to 15. So after the game, we're reporters talking to prominent players in the locker room, and one of the players came by and said something mad about uh, losing to Army. And so I said something. Uh, I wanted to make it loud enough that others would hear it to, I guess, to draw attention to myself as a brash teenager. And I said something unkind about some of the Army players. I didn't realize that that uh, Coach Belichick was in the locker room and, and I think he just was standing nearby with his arms folded as he does, just observing. So finished changing and headed out of the locker room and there's a tunnel there and uh, Belichick is in, the, in this little tunnel on the way out and as we're headed out he just sort of grabs my arm and pulls me against the wall. And he said, I heard what you said in there about the Army team. And he says, look, he goes, one of the things that you're going to have to remember is that, yeah, they're your opponent today on the football field. But someday, you may, in fact, be on a battlefield with them. They are your teammates, too. Don't ever forget that. But sure enough, was he right? And fast forward now to 9-11. To and I am uh, an, an admiral working on the Joint Staff in the Pentagon. And bang, we get hit. Yeah, went in the Pentagon. Went into the Pentagon. Went into, looks like it went in the Pentagon. Shortly thereafter, uh, I happen to be in a meeting, and I'm looking uh, at a fellow sitting next to me who looks very familiar and I can't figure out why. He's an army colonel, but I know he's a general select. It was a guy I played football against from army. And here we were now having to lock arms while half the building's on fire uh, and getting ready to deal with what we're going to do. Uh, and so that guy is now the superintendent of West Point as we sit here today. 
I really appreciated that Steve corrected me on the spot, warned me about something that, how could he have known that he really would be so prescient, and, and yet he was. into the Ricketts Hall, 1996. Coach Belichick was always around. He'd actually sit over there with his newspaper and his coffee and have his USA Today and be reading things. And it's almost like it gave him comfort being here. There's this sanctuary. People that were around him were really, really fortunate to be around a master. You know what I mean? Kind of like a, a Jedi, you know what I mean? A, a, Yoda, I mean, it was, I mean, you were around a, a very, very knowledgeable guy in this game. Yeah, I think one thing that my grandfather passed to my father that I've been truly able to appreciate, I think I was um, maybe started to understand uh, when he died, but now working for my dad and being with him on a day-to-day -day basis, have a short-term focus to achieve your long-term goals. I knew that about my grandpa, but I would say that was definitely past through my dad, and I could see that in my dad. But I could see that in both of them. Everybody talks about now that Coach Bill Belichick, but his greatness was his preparation. A lot of that comes from his dad. You know, he was the preparer. He was the guy that created scouting reports. He was the guy who went out and did that. He's the guy that prepared the mids you know, prepared them for football games on a smaller picture, but in a bigger picture, it prepared them for life as they went and served whatever their assignments were, uh, as they went into war, just preparation was key to being successful in everything. And it's so ironic for the Steve Belichick Library to be here. When you come in the morning, Steve Belichick was gonna be there with his newspaper and his coffee. You go, hey, Coach Belichick. Hey, how you doing? You know, had his gruff voice, and it's just the you know, twilight of his life. You know, just a wonderful person to be around. I mean, he was the institution of Navy football. You go back to see players from so far in front of you, so to speak, that remember him. And then you talk to young kids years after you who played for him. I mean, he was the institution of Navy football. Midshipman Roger Staubach is Mr. Football on the collegiate scene in 1963. Steve was a, a great coach. I was involved with him so much because of his scouting. He was a great scout. Then he's out there in practice as a defensive coach and just uh, really a tough guy in a good way and was, was loved by everybody on the team. It's fun for me to think about how the amount of people he's touched over the years, the kind of impact he's had is a great, great man. Lashinsky connects with Phil McConkie on fourth down. I believe that I'm the only player that played for Steve Belichick and then played for Bill Belichick in an NFL game. The Giants had won the Super Bowl, but the former Navy officer wasn't finished playing hero. Bill didn't grow up in the mines in Ohio. He didn't have to go through that. He didn't see it as directly as Steve did, but he's a product of it through his dad. So that work ethic permeated right down to Bill. And as tough as Bill is, I'm telling you, he's not as tough as his dad. As unrelenting as he is, he's, it's not close. That's how tough Steve Belichick was. Steve Belichick's service to our country goes far beyond anything that happened on the football field. The thousands of midshipmen football players that he trained during practice, you know, holding up the cards for the scout team, for the starting defense, training us in the off season in the gym, mentoring us, you know, off the field. It goes far beyond the football side of it. When things got tough, when things got tough on the football field, we defaulted towards the training that we had that was led by Steve. And when you were in the fleet and things were really critical, you defaulted back to all the things that you did and the discipline that you were taught in the focus. So it's 
was critical to uh, thousands of, of officers who, n not only for them, but how they taught thousands of people under them. So, it, you know, it goes from a Steve Belichick to a offensive lineman that played football at Navy for three or four years to that officer, now he's in the Navy, he assumes command and he's got thousands of sailors and Marines under him. That's critical. I mean, that's critical to the success of our military and our country. He was a towering figure at the Naval Academy when he was there, and uh, there's no question that he developed and made possible so, so many of the, the successes that all of us had, and uh, he was recognized as such. Steve Belichick helped us as young men, not only on the football field, but what we were preparing to do to focus far beyond what we thought our limits were. We were training the next four years to be naval officers, you know, to be combat officers in the United States Navy. So those lessons last a lifetime. And they're of great service to all the individuals and all the players that he had, but more importantly to our country. Being at the Naval Academy was perfect because his time in the service, he really understood the importance of, of serving and that's why he was there over 30 years. I mean, Steve didn't want to go anywhere else. Steve had offers to be a head coach at other, uh, other schools and he wanted to stay. That's how committed he was to the Naval Academy. One of the interesting things about my dad is because of his position at the Naval Academy, involved with football, but as an instructor, he had the longevity to stay at the Naval Academy and didn't move on like other coaches did. He was the one guy that when the players came back, when they had their reunions, he was always the guy that was there. He was the anchor, he was the mainstay. So he always saw them, they always saw him. So he maintained a contact with, you know, with those people. remember the night. It was uh, November 19th, 2005. Planned to meet Tom Frosch, who was a teammate. I hooked up with Tom and we drove over to Aberdeen Lane where Coach Belichick and his wife lived and just had a great evening. You know, nobody expected that that would be the last time. I mean, neither of us expected that that would be the last time that we'd see him. Now, the last day that he had with two players that he was close to that he coached watching the, the Fresno State USC game. Absolutely Chamber of Commerce weather on this Saturday night here at the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. And here come the number one rank winners of 32 straight, the USC Trojans. We stayed with him, uh, him and Jeanette, for a couple of hours. Took some pictures and just reminisced and talked about, uh, talked about our lives, you know, at that point, 13 years out from the academy. And just, uh, just spent a great, it was just a great evening. You know, we, we were friends at that point. And, and I know he, he so much appreciated um, us and you know, taking the time to come back and see him because at that point he was, you know, of course he was always our coach, uh, but he was our friend. We actually have the last pictures taken of Coach Belichick because he, he passed away within just a couple of hours of when we saw him. And um, I treasure those pictures. He fell asleep, passed away. Uh, so watching football, being with a couple of Navy, former Navy players, um, no, probably no better day for him than, than that. All right, so uh, after my dad passed away, I, I made a call to ask if my dad could be buried uh, in the cemetery. And uh, the response was, well, we'll have to check on that. So the Naval Academy Cemetery is a very special place. It's a place where we uh, honor, uh, we have buried and memorialized the legends and the heroes in the entire history of not just the Naval Academy, the United States Navy. Uh, ultimately, it is a superintendent of the Naval Academy decision. To be buried at the United States Naval Academy Cemetery 
you have to have not only graduated from the Naval Academy, you have to have retired uh, as a flag officer. So it's a very high bar to be buried in the cemetery. There are exceptions to that. Uh, those that are distinguished graduates who may not have made flag rank, those who are serving here at the Naval Academy in active service, so Naval Academy midshipmen, faculty, staff, uh, and then there is the exceptions. Those who have made such high contributions to not only the United States Naval Academy, but the United States Navy, the superintendent may make the exception for them to be buried at the cemetery. In the case of Mr. Steve Belichick, uh, the decision had to have been pretty easy. About a day later, uh, they came back and I was told that not only could he be buried there, but also uh, my mom, when she passes away, will be buried beside him. The case for Steve Belichick to be buried in such hallowed grounds is the fact that he affected thousands of lives as leaders in the United States military. So if you take this small sample, relatively small sample of Navy football players and what he gave all of us, helped us become great Naval officers. And that group taught thousands of other Navy and Marine Corps personnel. And so that translated over the battlefield. So to be buried where he is, it's a great honor and it's well, well deserved. It's a very special place for him uh, and me because when I was a kid, uh, we would go to Hospital Point, which is the field right below the, the cemetery and my dad and I would hit golf balls. We hit 100 golf balls and we go down and pick them up and turn around and hit them back the other way and turn around and pick them up and you know we go on Saturday afternoon just you know go hit ball, golf balls together. And then as I got older we went crabbing on the seawall. We would go crabbing on the seawall in the Severn and we would lay down our lines and same kind of thing. My mom would, you know, get up in the morning and say, what do you want to have for dinner tonight? And I'd go, what about crabs? I'd like, all right, great. So my dad and I would go to the seawall. We'd take the wicker basket, take out the, the chicken necks, roll them down in the sever and crab for a couple hours on the wall and come back and, and have that for dinner. So it was, it's a great place for me. It's a great place for my dad and I. We spent a lot of time together there. Uh, and just uh, him looking over there, that field and on the Severn River uh, is where you want to be. Ladies and gentlemen, Please join us in honoring our country as we do every day at noon with the singing of our national anthem. When I look at these walls, I see Americans. That's what, what America's about. <laughs> Working hard, giving back to this country. Uh, we all take from it. We all take the great, the freedom that we have. and great opportunity that we have, uh, but giving back, making it a little better place than, than the way you found it, with the people you touch or the message that you give or instill on people that will follow in your footsteps, but people that have given back their whole lives, really. The yeah, it's, it's a tremendous honor, it really is. Well, I mean, I know there's a lot of American dreams, but I think my dad's one of those. Really uh, a story of somebody that started out with not much, that was able to, through football, hard work, uh, perseverance, and a modest lifestyle, have a very successful life, and also impact a lot of other people with great values and work ethic.
there are millions, millions of stories like that. I'm proud that he's one of them. Yeah.